Correlation between gaming experience and what, how basically game developers can, you know, monetize them well. Okay, cool. Um, so then the next um, question I have for everyone is, <clears throat> and it's one that we get usually, um, especially when at Audimo, when we're when we are often talking to brands and uh, advertisers who are not video games companies, um, who kind of understand the idea of UA, so user acquisition, and understand the idea of actually um, advertising their game to to get more downloads. Um, so when we're talking more to like music labels and other people. A lot of the time, they don't fully, uh, they all want to get into games, but they don't fully understand it. So the next question is more around why should brands, do you believe brands should advertise in um, video games? I suppose, <laughs> you know, to be conversant, I, I, I kind of argue more why, why should they not? Um, you you want to be, as a brand, you want to be where the users are, don't you? You want to be where, and especially if you're, um, you know, mass brand so you're you know you're trying to aim at the millennials or, or younger then then people are playing games and they're specifically playing games on mobile you know people are not watching tv yes they're they're possibly watching um you know streaming but they're probably watching on their mobile not on their their large screen tv or their tablet so people are on mobile and the biggest thing that people are doing on mobile is is games so you know as an experience and as a type of content then that's being consumed, games is by far the biggest um, content out there and growing, um, and specifically mobile as well. I mean, I think, you know, the, the big reason why this has become such a massive topic for the industry over the last 10 to 15 years is the growth in mobile, the growth in free to play, the growth in hyper casual. So that's where the audience is. And if as a brand, you clearly you follow the audience. I think, you know, there is that evolution that's happened in the market from Initially, when you start putting ads into, uh, especially onto digital platforms, you generally want performance ads. You want something that clicks to the equivalent. You know, I'm in a game. I show an ad for another game, and and that you know drives um, drives people playing games. But we're now evolving beyond that because the market is getting so huge. Um, you, you're starting to get actual ads, uh, branded ads. So your kind of mass market ads, rather than or mass market brands, rather than the very specific performance. And that's where it gets much more interesting and you'd have that ability to to um to deliver you know users to to these brands in a way that they just can't get from from any other medium adding on top of that uh thanks chris uh completely agree again uh also wanted to add here in the end gaming is super you know diverse there's so lot specifically on hyper casual so many sub genres you can basically catch your player in different different games, racing games, cooking games, shooter games, lead, the list goes on. So you can get the attention and be contextual as much as possible. Taking, for example, a brand like Coca-Cola. Uh, they want to advertise in a cooking game because it seems like the best contextual. The spread of these games are pretty massive. So you can get a lot of users, you know, males, females, Every, uh, all sorts of uh, age groups. You can really target your campaign to get the best message out there within the gaming, um, the games you're basically looking to tap into. Yeah, yeah. I agree with Chris and Mauro totally. Like we spend four hours uh, on our mobiles every day. Most of that time we spend, we spend in apps. So why wouldn't brands uh, advertise there? I think the, the key here as well is that it doesn't have to be purely branding campaign, yeah? Uh, advertiser can work with network and make sure that they're like uh, optimizing towards their KPIs and ultimately like further down the, the installs. Like at Applovin, we've seen an increase in advertiser spending on apps, optimizing towards subscription. So yeah, I definitely think that this is the, the way forward. Yeah, yeah, uh, I agree too. Uh, actually, uh, uh, we all know the hyper casual games are really different, uh, and uh, it's a new trend. I think that's in the hyper casual in some market players from brands. I think that are in interesting big hits with uh, millions uh, download and integrate something uh, in this hit brand awareness activities, and that's uh, but. I think they are needed to uh, co correctly choose the settings and gender, uh, like Mer uh, told us. Yeah, it's it's correct. Yeah, no, I, I couldn't agree more. And uh, exactly as uh, Chris said, it's like why not? Given that 
it's where you want to be where the audiences and audiences are clearly especially uh post covid we've seen a 33 percent increase um in gaming downloads especially on mobile gaming so then the next question i have is and i think this one's a really interesting one um for, for the game developers um how are you measuring um ad engagement on your platforms so what is the statistic because sometimes with in-game ads it can be it can be different ways so if you're using images whether you're using video so how do how are you going about um tracking that engagement and measuring that engagement um within your platforms mm, maybe i said uh actually we uh, work with uh, dashboard of uh, our mediations for uh, relations engagement rates so so uh, we use uh, uh, analytics services, uh, collect data on our sites uh, and uh, analyze it, uh, except DAO, AppDAO, and frequency uh, for each uh, placement, uh, formats, etc., etc. Uh, showing me analyze sections for these parameters and dates, countries, levels, uh, etc., etc., and it's help us understand uh, mistakes or bottle of the next of our product because we are publisher. Uh, some parts of this pent uh, we translate uh, in our dashboard on the platform and we uh, exactly we can give a, a good feedback for developer. Uh, it helps developers understand how users are uh, live uh, in this game. Uh, but he has said the engagement in the, his game, um, something like that. Actually, I've got, so we, we at Adam, and we've done some, some interesting research into this, because um, one of the challenges with, with ads is to understand what the kind of the effect of, of an ad is. So, you know, you're talking more kind of bottom of the funnel. So not just how many ads you push in at the top, but actually what does the effect of that ad have? And, especially where it isn't a performance. I mean, it's very easy where you have a click and the person then goes off and downloads the game or buys the whatever it happens to be on, on Amazon, then you know that you've had an effectiveness. But when you're doing pure brand advertising, that isn't quite so, so obvious. So, you know, we did a piece of work, uh, actually some work with on-device uh, research and looked at that kind of um, bottom of funnel, the, the intent and the consideration. So you know, what was the effect? So basically it's, it, it's a survey. So it's getting people, it's um, putting it in front of a large panel, um, thousands of people, and then getting them to answer at the end of that and f figuring out what is the effect of these ads. And so we did a, um, a really interesting study on that. I and mean, we found really positive results actually at that bottom of, of the intent type of um, results and the consideration are they were they considering actually doing something based on the brand and the, the brand we used was actually a charity brand really interesting charity um you know were they actually um interested in um in then following through and, and getting involved and so on so we've done some research we've done some research and this is not the first time we've done that that actually really proves that if you put ads in a way that people see they recognize so they definitely see the ad and they definitely um, recognize. So, you know, th there's analytics that tells us that they saw the ad. There's that we can do an analysis to say that they actually recognize and they repeated seeing the ad. That's good. But the really interesting thing is when you get down to that kind of bottom of funnel and you start to analyze um, intent and consideration and those actual in, you know, important aspects. And that can really only be done when you're working with, you know, with, um, with companies like OnDevice uh, who do this kind of surveying. There's, there's a whole set of companies in the, in the ad space that, um, to do that, um, but yeah. We're actually doing uh, quite similar stuff uh, in terms of, uh, you know, brand list case study. So any brand coming in, you know, when I tap into in-game, eventually we're gonna um, arrange like a brand list case study, understand like the impact, uh, like we said, um, with regards to how effective their ads, uh, how, and how how much attention they're getting from the user uh, and ultimately brands understand that in game in particular you know are bringing the value that they're looking for when it comes to spreading their brand you know out there so this is why you know they continue to explore more opportunities understand what kind of genres additional genres they can they can tap into within gaming so uh yeah 
Yeah, for us, I mean, like the vast majority of the, the campaigns running on our platform would be performance oriented. Uh, so, yeah, as I mentioned before, they'd be looking uh, further down the uh, the installs towards mostly like we, we've had like many like uh, fitness apps. Uh, so in that case, that would be uh, that would be a subscription. Yeah. Cool. Um, and then, oh, sorry, go on. No, no, no. I just. Oh, okay. Um, so then, the next question I have, and it's one that um, always comes up, especially um, uh, being CTO uh, when we're talking to developers, is about retention. Um, and um, so the next question is around: How do we? How do you and your platforms ensure that um, you don't affect? or you have a minimal effect on user retention um, while we advertise. I have here, maybe like to weigh in here. Um, sorry, Chris. Um, no, no, go ahead. Uh, yeah, please. Okay. So uh, we've actually ran numerous tests with uh, game developers that basically looked at a simple thing. What's the retention with the, for example, running rewarded plus in game and what's the uh, retention they're seeing when it, they're running rewarded plus interstitial or rewarded plus banners. And we've seen like a steady difference when it comes to user retention, anything between 15 to 25, up to 30% difference when it comes to user retention. So, uh, so this is something that we're seeing in a positive way. And, you know, developers understand that the, the more time they can, you know, uh, keep the player within the game and do not send them out, the better retention it is. So it's like, it, it, adds, it, adds, it adds up in the end. I'm, I'm going to add to a little pitch because we've got a, so we've obviously got a stand and we did a, um, we did a report that we just, this has come out with Pocket Gamer. Um, and you can actually get it from, uh, from our stand. Um, so, you know, pop over there and, and pull it down, it's free. Um, and Pocket Gamer will be pushing it as well. It's a yearly um, report that, um, that we do in conjunction with Pocket Gamer, or work with Pocket Gamer on, which is looking at the whole, the whole space, but also looking at, you know, trends in, in the market. Um, and this is the, you know, this, this is now the second year that we've seen a really big push, first of all, the in, in gameplay ads, but actually one of the key considerations um, and one of the most important things for, for developers is interruptibility is they don't interrupt gameplay. Um, and I think that, you know, and this is just kind of following on uh, from what I was saying, um, that's key. You know, if you put stuff, and we've seen the same thing with, with, uh, with developers doing A-B testing with us um, and use it comparing, uh, putting our ads in compared to other kind of ad formats. And we see much better results because we're not interrupting gameplay. And it's, it's, the, it's the biggest thing. I mean, in the responses from the, from the study that the Pocket Gamer did, it's over 60% um, of people said that was the most important thing um, in, in all the kinds of different kinds of monetization formats from, you know, the, everything from control to, um, you know, video support, all that. The most important thing is that it does not interrupt gameplay. Um, and that's just because it makes sure that you don't get in the way of retention. So that has to be really important in, um, in making sure that you're not impacting, uh, impacting retention. Cause we, you know, as an industry, we have to monetize, we have to make money out of the, out of our users somehow or we don't have an industry, but we also need to make sure that we have a good gameplay experience. Um, and so kind of balancing those two things and coming up with ways of balancing those two things, be it, be it audio or be it um, video or a uh, static ads, but a way that just doesn't, doesn't stop the player and push them away. God, that's got to be the most important thing. Yeah, yeah, totally agree. Uh, advertising, uh, any uh, ad placement just doesn't interrupt the play and play time. And uh, of course, it uh, doesn't disturb users. Uh, and you, um, we, like a publisher, uh, have to find the balance between frequency of showing and our greed. <laughs> Uh, and uh, have a casual game work with interstitial in general uh, and uh, analytics is your best friend. You can always check your users who was lost after ads and how it was and fix it. Uh, and the uh, situation with Rever that video uh, is kind of different. They could have a positive influence on the product like uh, Mara told us. 
Yeah, I agree as well. And I think as well, nothing should be taken for for granted. Yeah, if our partners want to test like new uh, new ad placement, they should do it. And the truth is, they can do it in a very small subset of users as well. So if there is a loss, that would be minimal. And we're very lucky because we're working in an industry where all our partners are very keen on running A/B tests. It's, it's an interesting point that I made that actually, you know, ads don't have to be a negative experience. They can actually be a positive experience. You can make them a part of the game experience. You know, if you, I mean, these are very obvious ones with sports games, you expect to see ads on the sides of the, of the pitch. Um, and actually it looks strange when you don't see ads or those ads aren't real ads when they're kind of made up. So you want the, the, the ads to be there. And ideally as a user, you want them to be connected to you, you know, why should they be a general ad when they can be uh, personalized and they could be something that you're interested in? Because that's the point of ads here is about, you know, showing you something that is connected to what you want so that you, you know, you therefore go and buy it. So these can be positive experiences. And actually, as long as they are done in a, well, a way that integrates well with the game experience, then you should be able to add monetization and improve the, the gameplay in the same way. Yeah, and just one, one more thing as well. If we're looking, you know, at the non-paying uh, users, they're actually asking for ads. Yeah, so a rewarded video is here a great way to to keep your audience engaged and access the content you're you're providing. Yeah, I mean, rewarded video has been very successful in the industry from kind of actually combining monetization formats as well and combining your in-app purchase and your um, you know your ad format, and that's been a very powerful way of encouraging people to start to use in-app purchase. Um, and you find that, I, I know, you know my, my previous company, um, I was at um, Delta DNA, the analytics company, so we did a lot of the analytics on, on some of the in-app purchase stuff. And that side of things, we found that um, you actually reduce retention if you took away um, a rewarded video, because people expected that. They wanted to be able to also uh, generate some in-app purchases through, through rewarded. So, so these things can be quite positive. They don't have to be a negative experience as long as you do them well. And I think the industry was has been quite good at integrating that um, technology and you know turning it into a, um, a theater within the game experience where you go and you 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 go as a user and decide you want to get an, a, a video. You watch the video and you get something back for it. So that type of um, structure that actually isn't interrupting is a positive experience, but is giving the user something back is really where you want to get to in, a, in, um, in any kind of ad monetization. You want to make sure it fits well with the experience rather than detracting and stopping gameplay. Yeah, um, I, I think that, that makes a lot of sense. And also, uh, I think what David said um, is a perfect segue to my next question around a B testing. So the next question is around how can game developers leverage user level ad data and A B testing to understand the true lifetime value of their users? Yeah. Yeah. So maybe I can start with, with this one. So on the user level data, so this is really helping game developers understanding the true value of the users they acquire per network, uh, per campaign, and ultimately it's helping them making better uh, decisions when it comes to bidding per the channel, yeah. It's also giving them an understanding of like the behavior of each single uh, user, and partners can they can adapt their monetization strategy uh, depending on the on the user type. If we're looking at the A/B testing, this is really crucial because you need to make sure that you've got the most optimized setup that is yielding the maximum revenue. So what it means, like if you're running like a, a game that is mostly uh, driven, you need to make sure uh, that you've got the most uh, competitive waterfall uh, setup with a mix of uh, bidders and uh, mediated, uh, mediated network. And the truth is your setup is going to change during the lifetime of your app. Yeah, uh, the setup you have at the early early testing stage versus an app that is a few months old is going to be drastically different why because you're going to be you're going to have a different like u.s strategy you're going to be also like monetizing better in in some geos and you're going to need to make sure that you're running tests for ultimately adding the the highest uh, the highest order yeah so if you let's say you run a 50 50 test within your monetization uh, on your mediation platform you can quickly quickly identify like which uh, which subset of users is yielding the most revenue and this is really going to help you uh, fuel your ua yeah yeah actually we use uh, uh 
um, this uh, kind of uh, uh, tools uh, on mediation platform like uh, like Aplavin uh, or Iron Source, uh, all they are have uh, AB uh, testing instruments. Uh, we checking uh, checking any setups for our monetization with with bidding with uh, any hybrid uh, waterfall with bidding and non bidding uh, setups. Uh, and of course, we use a A/B test for uh, checking our in-app hypothesis, like uh, any uh, kind of color in our game, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, as as I told before, this analytics is your best friend again. Uh, and uh, actually, we we happy to use user level reports for our products for checking user behavior in our games. And how many ads they see, uh, how much time they spend in our games, uh, how they are value, uh, and uh, we. That's that's the reason that we evaluate the our income and traffic uh, and calculate uh, and predict our LTV. So again, so actually looking back to um, my previous, so I, I was previous before I was at Adamo. I was um, I was one of the co-founders and CTO at. Delta DNA, so the analytics company that's now owned by Unity. Um, and obviously that is all about, I mean, Delta is a fantastic platform for doing user level testing and for A-B testing and for really understanding your, 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 um, your users right down to that user level. And I think one of the frustrations we had at, um, at Delta was that though we, could, we weren't able to integrate very well with ad tech, um, so we could obviously get that data from from in-app purchase, we can know, you know, so you could exactly know who was um, who was buying and what they were doing, and you could integrate that data really well. But from ad tech, you generally couldn't get that user level data. It was always at a kind of aggregated level. So one of the things we've um, I, I've implemented at Adamo, and we've we brought Adamo, is that ability to do user level data. So we can provide our developers with that direct user level data that allows them to pull that data directly into their um, their other existing analytics platforms. Because ultimately, with analytics, you want a single, a single view of the truth. That's that's the objective of this. You want to bring all the data into one place, and then you want to be able to analyze it. You want to be able to A/B test it. You want to be able to understand, you know, what the users are doing. Is it impacting your in, um, IAP purchasing? Is it impacting your retention? You know, why is this, and how is that um, being affected by the behavior? So it was very important to us to make sure we could actually deliver that kind of level. Of data that would actually allow um, the developers to um, so make it as developer friendly as possible, so that they can do this. Because, you know, as I said, analytics is your friend. If you're um, if you're doing free to play games and you're doing hyper casual games, you have to know your users. If you don't, then you're just blind. So you've got to get that data into a good way, and you've got to bring all the data together so you can properly analyze it and you can run these kinds of tests. We, on our end, we basically listened to the market. We understood that, you know, lifetime value and uh, getting as much information as possible from providers, a provider like ourselves is truly critical for hyper casual developers. And we understood that this could, you know, bring us, bring better service, better, um, better support for the game developers. So we basically added it as part of our platform. We're seeing good feedback and we understood that this is this is what important for our you know hyper casual developers they're looking to not see how much they're buying on one end how much they're making across you know networks doesn't matter which one um and understand like how much each user actually values them and you know coordinate accordingly Well, thanks for that, more. And the next question, and I think um, actually it was Chris who touched on this, which is, um, what are your thoughts on hybrid monetization models? So that's um, so in-app advertising mixed with some um, in-app purchase, so IAP. Let's get uh, the panel's thoughts on on doing that. Those uh, those hybrid models, and if they think they work. I, I suppose, you know, I just follow on from what I said. I, I think they're really good. I think you've got to have a mixture. It depends on the game. There, there's there's absolutely games that are pure um, advertising driven. And I know the hyper casual space is probably more to that, that direction than other free to play games. But 
having a mixture of um, actually a mixture of monetization all the way through the game experience is good. So, you know, everything from rewarded videos to if you've got certain places where interstitials work, then you should definitely use them because obviously they generate the most um, revenue. Your know, in-game advertising doesn't impact, doesn't affect that. It's not either or. So again, you can do that. Um, so forms of in-app purchase as well, be it that you know, the very simple ones where, you know, people do it just purely to switch off advertising, which obviously we're not quite so keen on, but, you know, you can you can do those kinds of, you know, you could uh, allow the user to choose between that right the way through to much more kind of interesting ones where they're actually buying add-ons and extensions and evolving the game experience. So, but you want to try and join these things together. I mean, that that is ultimately where you, you want to get to. You want to have an overall experience that feels like it fits together, not kind of siloed monetization where it's, you know, either people spending money or people being advertised. And, you know, I, I remember looking back and people were talking about, well, I won't show my ads to people who I'm trying to monetize. Well, that actually doesn't work, especially with things like Rewarded, because the Rewarded is a great bridge between the two. You know, you want the advertising because it helps people to generate some in-game currency, and actually that in-game currency encourages them to buy more in-game currency. So actually thinking intelligently about these things and joining them together is where we really want to get to, rather than trying to kind of silos into it's all ads, it's all ads, or it's all in-app purchase, or it's only one kind of monetization. You really want to try and expand the experience so that people can, you know, so the feel, so it feels like a, a unified experience rather than you know these kind of siloed experiences. Yeah. Uh, as for me, uh, I like uh, hybrid monetization. Actually, uh, if you discussed about uh, hyper casual games, I think uh, we see any new stage of uh, hybrid products uh, really soon because uh, competition on the market is really high. Uh, it's really complicated uh, if you want to create something new uh, and most likely your idea has been created yet. And uh, I think we, we can see how the hyper casual games could be more complicated again, uh, adding metagame uh, and content with, with any in-apps for uh, increasing your LTE uh, for more uh, traffic uh, and for the other sites uh, no ads it's a uh, pool chase uh, enough pool chase too <laughs> anyway yeah i agree i don't think it should be like one one or the other uh, like we've seen like uh, partners even on the hyper casual like uh, working towards like their shop offering more more aaps and that result is really in a, in a better engagement from those from those users and sometimes like even on the hyper casual games we went to aaps that were around like uh, the, it were around 20%, and it's not something we've uh, really seen uh, before. Adding here that, um, like, you can see for, we can see for ourselves that hyper-casual developers, at least some of them are becoming more towards casual rather than the straightforward hyper-casual that we're all used to on, on, on various genres. So casual brings more opportunities when it comes to you know in our purchases so what i'm seeing what i believe what i what i'm thinking is hybrid will be much more popular uh, as opposed to now when it comes to hyper casual uh at the moment we all know ads are you know really popular um and in the end like uh, chris said it's a matter of gaming experience some games it can be relevant to have in a purchases depends on the game flow some of them are just you know pure ads um, so it's a matter of, you know, being contextual within the game, I believe. Yeah, no, all, honestly, really great points. Um, and, and I, I think from even my experience, I've de we've definitely seen the increase of, of the two in use being used in conjunction and hybrid models, um, uh, to Chris's point and also to what Zara was saying in terms of there's opportunities um, in the different parts of the game for you to use different kind of um, advertising formats. Um, the next question is, and uh, I guess it, it does lead on for the last question. So can free to play games ever replace paid games? And the real question is, are we all biased here? <laughs> well, uh, I, I, sorry, I'm kind of missing this. When you say, do you mean Purely premium games, are you meaning just in our purchase? Oh, I mean, um, actually, premium because we have to pay for them. So, like, so let's say, yeah, yeah, yeah. Pay, to, uh, pay to play. I yeah, think okay. that, yeah. 
Actually, I, uh, I think this for um, if we discuss about mobile games, uh, there are um, different uh, niches, and uh, free-to-play model is dominant on the market. So I think that already replace it <laughs> uh, and uh, free-to-play models more profitable and more comfortable for any business and uh, at least simply buying traffic for uh, free-to-play games I think uh, by by the way the payment games uh, have our segment there I think it's any mobile uh, ports uh, for triple-a games uh, from PC or any premium thing like that yeah, so there's some great content given on the on the paid uh, paid apps, but the truth is you're not going to be be able to uh, not going to be able to scale them. Uh, so for me, the the question is definitely uh, yes, free to play will replace uh, uh, paid games, and uh, like I think there's going to be a mixture ultimately of uh, AAP uh, AAP and that. Like you see more of like the AAA studios also integrated some other elements, so that's going to be an interesting thing to follow. Yeah. Yeah, I completely agree with David uh, regarding what you just said uh, regarding AAA. So, you know, game developers that are running primarily, for example, on console, on on PC, and they're basically looking to tap into or already tapping into, you know, the mobile space. So uh, for them, it seems obvious to, you know, have a paid app within the game and then understand, okay, do I want to monetize them additionally? On top of being, you know, being a paid user from the get-go, um, so still free to play. But I think there will be a value for, uh, you know, paid apps as well eventually. Thanks, Gerg. And um, definitely seen some interesting developments in in this field as well. In terms of even on console, there's been some experiments around rewarded video ads um, between loading screens and stuff. So, which is quite interesting. And in terms of getting rewards in the game, so yeah, definitely think it's a, a definitely a space to watch. Then the next question I have is um, the overall. What are the what overall strategies um, are there to increase um, average revenue per per daily active user? and, and um, basically bidding on across um, the different networks. So that can be like bidding networks or non-bidding networks. What would you guys say are the overall best strategies to increase that um, average, um, the average revenue you're making per user? Yeah, so I think the first thing we need to think about is you need to have the most competitive setup uh, able. You need to, uh, in place, you need to have the relevant bidders. Like the good thing about bidders is that they have a view on every single request and they can decide on not to bid the, for that impression. So this is really driving the ACPM support. What we see on Aplovin is that 50 to 60% of the revenue is being driven by bidders. So then you really have only like 40% of the 40% of the remaining revenue that you need to uh, that you need to, to optimize. And as I mentioned before, this optimization is really an ongoing process. Yeah, you're not gonna need to optimize uh, alongside when you're you're scaling your, your apps. Yeah, uh, more revenue. Uh, I think these bidders uh, now dominate the market, uh, and it's really an understandable uh, monetization with bidders are automotive and uh, any levers that you have for optimizing it. It's uh, uh, incoming traffic and uh, any A-B testing that you uh, just rotate uh, in A-B tests, uh, any bidders and uh, any um, I don't know, bunch of bidders or uh, any uh, hybrid monetization with bidders and waterfalls. Uh, in case with non-bidding and worse, the strategy builds the, um, any um, optimization of waterfalls with uh, splitting tiers in different countries, uh, works with uh, 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 ad networks placements and waterfalls. But that's all, I think. Uh, uh, anyway, I hope uh, all uh, ad networks are going to Bidding soon, <laughs> it's um, will be more comfortable. I think. So at Adamo, so we we do a combination of um, of both uh, direct ads. So we have our own you know ad team, and we go out and sell direct campaigns. And obviously, with those, you know, um, we can get we can get some really good uh, good CPMs from that. Um, but we also then connect into ad exchanges, and you know, the more ad exchanges and the more ability to to put those ads in front of potential bidders. Ultimately, is how we, you know, how we increase the um, the likelihood of getting the best bid because we then run a competitive auction 
um, against the ad exchanges, and they, they run it again as well. Um, and then we're looking at the results from that, and we always you know, pick the, 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 <laughs> the highest um, value um, bid back to make sure that we, we optimize that. So a lot of it is to do with a combination of you know, direct campaigns, um, but also having the ability to, um, to um, access a wide range of exchanges. I think it's interesting you were talking about AppData, um, because obviously the, you know, the ad industry is very focused on CPM, um, but one, one of the things that you know, we see certainly in the in gameplay kind of space is that we can put a lot more ads in front of users. So actually the number of ads, rather than a, you know, uh, having just a one or two or three ads because of this retention problem, with in gameplay, we can show a lot more ads because they're, um, they're not interrupting the gameplay. And that allows us to often generate more um, actual revenue, even though our CPM may potentially be lower because the value may be lower on a per ad basis, but the number of ads we can actually show so that the ads per, um, per user, in essence, is higher. And so ArpDAO is actually, we, we often talk to developers about the increase we can do to ArpDAO rather than CPM, just because it actually makes more sense and it kind of fits into their monetization strategy, which is, you know, we're generating X amount of money, especially if it's in that purchase, we can actually increase that through um, through showing ads, but it does it does mean that sometimes you know you can't directly compare different monetization strategies um, if you're looking at things like CPM compared to you know this um, this value per user lifetime value etc. So Opta is a really interesting way of or kind of um, bringing everything into one context, which is how much that actually do I make 